Too many Republican leaders are lying to America. A final buck you to his party, and the congressman from Colorado says he's out. The judge on the Barry Morphew murder case speaks out for the first time, telling next that the prosecutor retaliated against his family. She didn't like my rulings, and um, she wanted to work up a basis to get me off the case. Migrants forced out of Denver shelters build an encampment, and they're forced out of that, too, leaving the question, where should they go? And a new challenge for an old Thanksgiving tradition in Denver. Let's try to keep Daddy Bruce's legacy alive. Tonight on Next. Congressman Ken Buck changes positions faster than a yoga teacher on whether to repeal Obamacare, whether to give fetuses personhood, whether to try and overturn the 2020 election, whether to make an election denier Speaker of the House. Buck's latest flip could be his last flip. He's decided not to run for re-election. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger looks ahead to the mad scramble by conservatives to grab that safely Republican seat. I made the decision to leave Congress because tough votes are being replaced by social media status. Republican Congressman Ken Buck just said TTYL, peace, in part because he cannot stand election denialism. The same Ken Buck who voted for new House Speaker Mike Johnson, who is an election denier, after not voting for the previous option, Jim Jordan, because he was an election denier. Too many Republican leaders are lying to America, claiming that the 2020 election was stolen, describing January 6th as an unguided tour of the Capitol, and asserting that the ensuing prosecutions are a weaponization of our justice system. Congressional District 4 is a heavily Republican district that covers Weld County, Douglas County, and all of eastern Colorado. So who will run for his seat? To find out, I used the rarely used phone app on my phone and called more than a dozen possible candidates. No one said, yes, they're running. But the candidates considering a run include Deb Flora, a conservative talk radio host who tried to run for U.S. Senate last year, State Senator Jerry Sonnenberg, State Representative Richard Holtorf, former District Attorney George Brockley, who told me he had never given it serious consideration because it was never real, and now that it's real, he needs to give it serious consideration. Doug Co. Commissioner Laura Thomas, who told me it's something her team is certainly thinking about, and her fellow Doug Co. Commissioner Abe Layden. Former State House Minority Leader Patrick Neville told me he needs to prey on his decision. The no's are Weld County Sheriff Steve Reams, who said it was not in his family's best interest. Former State GOP Chair Christy Burton Brown, who told me she is highly likely to run for State Board of Education next year. Doug Co. Commissioner George Teal, former state Senator Greg Brophy, and current state Senator Barb Kirkmeyer, who lives in Congressional District 8, but you don't have to live in the district you represent. I have not heard back from former gubernatorial candidate Heidi Ganahl or State House Minority Leader Mike Lynch. It's amazing what the phone app can do on a phone. There are two candidates who are in. One announced just a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to show you Trent Lisey. Yeah, he's wearing... A MAGA hat, hugging a flag, and the video is going to speak for itself. Oh, that's a Trump dance. It's a Trump dance. He's, he's speaking to the, the voters of CD4, perhaps. There's another candidate, Justin Schreiber, who has filed paperwork on the Republican side. There are a couple of Democratic candidates, but we did this quiz uh, in the newsroom. There are 17% Democrats in Congressional District 4. 17%. 17%. It's not a lot. No, 35% Republican, 46% unaffiliated. Which means, barring something wild happening, this is a safe Republican seat for a long time. Crowded primary means that somebody could get not a whole lot of the vote and get a seat for life. Yeah, we talk about getting into the side door of the state capitol with these small committees. I mean, you're going to have the whole district getting to vote in the primary. The Republicans will decide and the unaffiliateds will decide. But that person's likely to win the general and will have that. Look at Doug Lamborn. Went through this in 06, 07 and has had that seat in Colorado Springs for life after a battle of like five or six in a primary. You think we're going to get 20 candidates in the race? I don't think we'll get to 20. Not 20? Uh, no, no, no. I don't think so. Okay. No. I think it'll be a fraction of that chart that we had. I'll take 20. All right. Thank you, Marshall. There may be no better example of how Republican politics in Colorado and in America have shifted than the case of Ken Buck. How a congressman went from the far right fringe of his party to being outflanked by an even fringier fringe that now mocks him as too middle of the road. Ken Buck is only middle of the road if you pave the shoulder and the ditch. Now, Ken Buck is popular on CNN and MSNBC these days because he calls out Republicans for election rigging lies. But remember, this is the same Ken Buck who called man-made global warming a hoax, compared homosexuality to alcoholism, backed a constitutional ban on abortion, state limits on some forms of birth control. All that 
And Buck has been disowned by the Colorado Republican Party that he once led as chairman because Buck will not repeat Donald Trump's election lies. Yet, just last week, Buck helped to elect a House Speaker who played a key role in trying to overturn the election. If that sounds like a confusing contradiction, it is. This is probably a very confusing time to be Ken Buck, the man whose party tilted so far to the right, he fell off the map. The judge who presided over the Barry Morphew murder case is now accusing the district attorney of investigating his family, the judge's family, in an act of retaliation for his rulings. Ramsey Lama is no longer a judge, so he's able to speak freely. He gave the first interview of his life to our Mark Salinger. My name is Linda Stanley. I'm the district attorney for the 11th Judicial District. There is no more powerful prosecutor in Chafee, Fremont, and Custer counties than Linda Stanley. For me, today is a good day. When she brought murder charges against Barry Morphew in the 2020 case of his missing wife, Stanley stood outside her office in Salida, pledging to play by the rules. That we cannot talk about any open or active investigation, and that is per the rules of professional conduct that we will abide by. Two years later, the rules she followed let us hear. I don't think um, she's competent for that position. Uh, and I say that based on my experience being a judge here. Ramsey Lama was the judge that presided over the Morphew case in Fremont County. Today, he's speaking publicly for the first time after leaving the bench last year. I think the public needs to know who Linda Stanley is and what she did in that case to a sitting judge presiding over a case. They need to know that. A complaint filed by the Attorney Regulation Council to the Colorado Supreme Court, along with police reports, corroborate Lama's allegations. It starts with, of all things, a YouTube video made during the Morphew trial. Some YouTuber in a bulletproof vest appeared on video, essentially threatening me and doxing me and my family, uh, asking me to get off the case. Lama says it was full of unfounded conspiracy theories, including a claim that he abused his ex-wife. Totally crazy. Um, never abused my ex-wife, just baseless. And of course, he's in a uh, bulletproof vest, and he's looking at the camera saying, Judge Lama, you better get off or more is coming. Court filings suggest District Attorney Stanley saw that video too. In the complaint filed with the Supreme Court, it alleges Stanley asked a commander at the Chafee County Sheriff's Office to investigate the allegation of domestic abuse launched in the YouTube video. The commander refused, saying there was no evidence to base it off of, according to the complaint. Stanley is quoted telling investigators she believed the allegations against Lama also influenced his rulings in court. My ex-wife was followed. Uh, strangers were appearing at her church, following her to a playground with, with our son asking, hey, tell us about Judge Lama and your marriage. Was he abusive? Did he beat you? We're trying to get him off the case. After law enforcement declined to investigate Lama, he says someone showed up at his ex-wife's house asking her about the allegations from the YouTube video. Court filings show police and sheriff's deputies say it wasn't them. Then Lama says he got a call from the police chief in Canyon City. And he informed me, you know, <laughs> you're gonna need to sit down for this one, Judge. I said, okay. And uh, they got information that it was a district attorney investigator who contacted my ex-wife to interview her about our marriage. While the Barry Morphew case is pending, while I am the sitting judge on the case, that happened. District Attorney Stanley ended up dropping charges against Morphew. Lama does not mince words on what he believes Stanley's intent was. Uh, I think an elected official who's the top prosecutor uh, using investigative resources, taxpayer dollars, to investigate a judge um, on nothing, totally baseless, uh, because they didn't like their rulings, that's scary. And I think if you're engaging in that kind of conduct, you have no business being a DA. The uh, question was if the suspect, Mr. Morphew, had answered any of our questions or told us where Suzanne Morphew's body is. We reached out to and Stanley repeatedly over the past two days with questions about Lama's allegations. We have not yet heard back. She now faces the complaint in the Supreme Court. Lama wants to see her lose her law license. Using resources in that manner, clearly designed to intimidate a judge, uh, or if it was for retribution, it's, it's so wrong. An elected prosecutor versus a judge. That's what this day is about, and it's a good day. Thank you. Which Lama says should never happen.
I don't think there's any room for that in Fremont County or anywhere in Colorado or, or the country as a whole. Shouldn't be happening. The complaint filed with the Supreme Court also alleges that Stanley withheld information from defense attorneys while instead sharing that information with true crime podcasters and YouTubers. The long list of complaints against her could end with her losing her law license. We also reached out to former Judge Lama's ex-wife to corroborate the story through her, but did not hear back. I truly have never heard of anything like this before. Have heard of situations where parties to a case and conspiracy theorists might target a judge, but the idea of, of prosecutors targeting a judge, and he really did fear for himself and his family. Yeah, during those preliminary hearings, former Judge Lama had police outside of his home. He had police escorts just to get to the courthouse, Kyle. That's how serious they took this. All right, Mark Salinger. Very interesting. Thank you, Mark. Bruce Randolph, Daddy Bruce. That man started a legacy of kindness in Denver more than 50 years ago. Each Thanksgiving, food from his barbecue restaurant would feed thousands of people for free. Daddy Bruce has been gone for decades now, but that Thanksgiving tradition continues with some new challenges. And that's why it's this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign. Daddy Bruce's mission was both simple and difficult, to feed thousands of families in need each Thanksgiving. The nonprofit Epworth Foundation keeps that work alive through its annual Feed a Family event in honor of Daddy Bruce. Providing a Thanksgiving dinner to thousands of families in Denver and Aurora, they have given out more than 50,000 of those Thanksgiving baskets over the years. The challenge now is passing the torch to a new generation. Two older leaders who organized the Thanksgiving meals have passed away in recent years. So now a younger generation is trying to keep Daddy Bruce's legacy of giving going. The nonprofit is raising money now to put together those Thanksgiving meal baskets for families who need them. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word THANKS to 303-871-1491 to get that link to donate. Your $5 donations have combined to do some amazing things. So as always, I'll match the first 50 donations of 5 bucks to get us started. Denver should not lose a Thanksgiving tradition that dates back to 1967. So let's see what we can do together to keep Daddy Bruce's legacy alive. It's been a goal forever. It only happens when you fund it. Colorado's finally going to give schools the funding that they are owed. But is the governor taking credit for something his political opponents did? Donald Trump's latest legal battle is still playing out in a courtroom in Denver. His team says he wasn't inciting an insurrection, just free speech. And migrants pushed out of Denver shelters are now being pushed along as they live on Denver streets. Attorneys for former President Donald Trump tried to get a judge in Denver today to quickly rule in their favor, to just end the trial over whether Trump should appear on Colorado's ballots. Trump attorney Scott Gessler asked the judge to issue the verdict in the middle of the trial. He said the plaintiffs had failed to make their case that Trump's 2024 campaign is unconstitutional because he incited the January 6th insurrection. Attorneys for the voters who brought the lawsuit are trying to prove that Trump's speeches and social media posts encouraged his supporters to breach the Capitol. Trump's team says it was freedom of speech. The judge requested, rejected the request to rule right away. She said a lot of these arguments have never been settled in court before, that the constitutional issues are too complex to rush her verdict. Democratic Governor Jared Polis is proposing a state budget about a billion dollars bigger than last year's. It could also be the first budget in 14 years to fully fund Colorado schools. Since 2009, Colorado has relied on what's called the budget stabilization factor to take more than $10 billion in education funding and use it for other stuff. Last year, legislators passed a bipartisan bill forcing the state to quit doing that this year or pardon me, next year. So some of those people who passed that bill, like Republican Senator Barb Kirkmeyer, are now accusing the governor of taking credit for what a bipartisan group in the legislature did. The governor says it was his office that had to account for the extra $141 million required to make the goal happen and that the legislature still has to sign off. It's not a done deal in that sense. The legislature could say, we want to fund $70 million of that $140 million and put the other $70 million off for another year. We believe that both Republicans, Democrats, Joint Budget Committee, believe in achieving this goal of fully funding our public schools. Governor's budget proposal also sets aside $200 million in case property tax measure Prop HH passes. That's the measure the Democrats are promoting. Governor wants to hold that money in the budget to immediately backfill lost tax revenue to local governments and schools. What we are doing today is unacceptable. Denver goes ahead with plans to sweep an encampment of migrants, despite an outcry from folks who say they have nowhere else to go. Talk to the migrants arriving in Denver, as we have, and they'll say they just want to work. They want to find a safe place to stay. 
Yet some are living on the streets after they've exceeded the time allowed in Denver shelters. Our Angeline McCall was at an encampment of migrants that then got swept by the city. Living on the street isn't what they wanted, but for now, the migrants living here accept it. It's their only option. Jeremy has been living in this tent for more than two weeks. He's run out of time in Denver's shelter system, and now he's being told to leave here too. The city says this is parkland, no camping or overnight sleeping allowed. Denver Parks and Rec says people were notified for the past eight days. Jeremy says this is the first he's heard anything. We're going to have more migrants coming throughout the whole month. Okay, the well, yeah, these right folks now, need a place to folks. stay right now, right now. tonight. Yeah. So where, where would you like me to take them? Amy Beck is a homeless advocate and wants a different solution, a shelter option. They have kicked them out of the hotel. And the next day, they are in violation of the camping ban. Others from Venezuela worry the same will happen to them. Claro, porque también me puede pasar a mí porque yo me sacando donde yo estoy, también puedo. Yo tengo que dormir en la calle. In a week, Ramon will be out of the shelter. Igual que yo son venezolano igual que yo. Todos somos seres humanos. Todos sufrimos. Todos queremos un apoyo. Jeremy knows for now, life is out here. Estresado. Pero ahí son así, son las cosas. Arriba, más arriba. Rules are rules. Sí, porque es verdad, tienen sus razones y eso son cosas que tienen que respetar. Even as he settles across the street, he knows others will join him when their time is up. Esto se va a poner más lleno. Cada vez, cada vez más personas. The mayor's office says the encampment was moved due to it being on Parks and Rec property, also adding that there have been open fires and other concerns there. They say notice was provided, and one of the rangers told me that he was sharing that with people, that they would have to move for the past eight days or so. But this is a changing population every day with new people arriving by the day to this encampment and others leaving regularly to find work. So I spoke with one person who said he was told yesterday he would have to move. Every single other person I asked told me that today was the first that they heard about it. We're headed towards a really urgent point here, Angeline, because we've got the weather starting to turn and we see a lot of folks still coming up from, from the southern border. And this issue is not going to get resolved anytime soon. No, and that's something that we asked Jeremy. We asked him, you know, what do you think about this? You're having to move. And he says, every single day more people are coming out of the shelter system and they have no place to go. So they just go across the street, essentially, and they set up a camp and they hope that they're able to find a tent. And so this is really just the beginning. And we've asked the mayor in the past if he treats migrants and the local homeless community as different. And he says that they have different concerns. But at the end of the day, both of them are ending up on the streets like this. Looks a, looks a whole lot similar at the end of the day when you watch a camp being moved and people just saying, eh, where do I go? Angeline McCall, thank you very much. Your feedback and our work together to continue Daddy Bruce's Thanksgiving tradition, next. Daddy Bruce Randolph is a name that Coloradans still know, even 20 years after his death, almost 60 years after Daddy Bruce first started feeding people in need at Thanksgiving. Now a new generation is trying to keep his Thanksgiving meals going. The nonprofit Epworth Foundation runs the Feed a Family event each year in honor of Daddy Bruce. They build thousands of Thanksgiving baskets to give away to families in need in Denver and Aurora. And the challenge is keeping people invested and alive in this mission as they pass the torch to a new generation. We can help. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me and donating a few bucks to support the Epworth Foundation in this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign. Feedback from Richard, who says, Just watch you criticize Ken Buck. If you think you're so smart, why don't you run for office and see how that goes for you? You're nothing more than an armchair quarterback. Well, Richard, I would say that my job is to tell you what the congressman's views are and to tell you when they change. You can decide what you think of his views. As for your suggestion that only current and former politicians should be allowed to criticize or cover elected officials, doesn't sound like America to me. See you next time.